So is it possible for one drum technique to completely mess up your playing? Well, that's what almost happened to me, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this next lesson. Now, before we get started, if your goal is to get better at drums, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Also, make sure you click that notification bell so you know exactly when new lessons are dropping. So is there really a drum technique that can completely mess up your playing? Well, that's what happened to me, and that drum technique is the Moeller method. So what is the Moeller method? So it's the idea of building kinetic energy and then letting that kinetic energy push the stick forward, which is great because in a sense, the stick does all the work for you. Now to understand how this almost completely messed up my playing, you have to go back to when I was a young drummer. My goal, like so many young drummers, was to be able to play fast. But also like so many young drummers, I didn't do enough exercises with my hands to build the muscles to be able to play fast. Then one day when I was around 16, 17 years old, my teacher showed me Muller method. And it was like a miracle to me. Once he showed me the flow and I understood how to do a molar triplet, it was like speed overnight. I was playing single strokes and tempos that I've never even touched before in my life. Never even gotten close because it's the idea that the stick is doing all the work for you. So naturally, as a young drummer, everything became about the molar method. It was like speed, 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 speed. I could go so fast and there was so little effort. So I coasted on the molar method all through high school and going into college. And man, did I sound impressive with a lot of my licks and chops because I could move really, really quick. But that's also where you could get into trouble. I wish I could say that I came to this realization on my own, but it wasn't until I took a lesson with the late, great Kim Plainfield. Now, for those of you that have studied with Kim and you know him, he was the tough teacher. So on my very first lesson in college with Kim, he said, okay, Jay, let me hear you do some trading fours back and forth. I started playing a groove. Then when it came time to solo, here comes all the molar. And of course, because I'm trying to impress Kim with my fast chops, the entire solo was completely devoid of rhythm. In other words, I was playing patterns of accents and stickings with no rhythmic note value foundation. Ergo, I wasn't keeping the beat. I wasn't doing my job as a drummer. So when I was done with a couple of rounds of that, I looked at Kim, he looked at me, and God's honest truth, he went, <sighs> Don't you ever do that again in this low, monstrous Kim Plainfield voice. He said it and the hair on my neck just stood up and I was terrified. Then he went on to say, listen, I don't ever want to hear about molar. I don't want to know from molar. I don't want you to use the molar method. I don't want to hear the molar stroke. I don't want to hear anything like that. From now on, no molar. Now let me be clear. This is not because Kim Plainfield was anti-molar stroke or anti-informal strokes. He recognized in me as a student that I was way, way too heavily dependent on the molar method to get around. The challenge is I did not have any control over those chops because I could really only do them fast. When it came to slowing it down, even just a little bit to be at the tempo that I need to be at, a lot of times the lick wouldn't feel good to me and I didn't have that balance. I didn't have that support to come in and make the rhythm sound like the notes they were supposed to be. Also at that time, not having a good sense of what notes were in general, that had a little bit to do with it as well. So how did I go ahead and overcome this? Well, the trick is to understand the idea of motion and speed versus physical endurance. Physical endurance is the idea of your muscles being able to push those sticks physically. Notice when I do those single strokes, there's no accents happening. I'm just playing them all the same and at one stick height. With the molar method, you're constantly pushing an accent. So from then on, we got into a strict regimen of muscle building and working on those formal style accents. And on top of that, he really refined the idea of rhythm and understanding what kind of notes I was playing. So all I have to say is, thank God for Kim Plainfield, because he probably single-handedly saved my playing. So what is the molar method? So basically when you're talking about the molar method, you're talking about accents on the drums. Accents are your louds versus your softs. And putting those things together. When you do put those two things together, it gives a sense of melody 
over the rhythm that you're playing. Now inside this accent category, there's two techniques that you can draw from. The first one being the formal style or the marching style of drumming. And then the informal style or what some people call the molar method. Now the formal style is more based on straight lines. It's more deliberate strokes that you control with your muscles. So in general, you're basically pushing and pulling the stick. And if you notice, everything is coming from my wrists. The informal style is a little bit different because instead of using your muscles to control the stick, you're using the momentum of the stick itself. Now the informal style is based off of a whip stroke. Now as you can see, a whip provides a lot of energy. And if all that energy gets absorbed into the drum, there's a huge potential for the stick to rebound. So the idea behind the informal style is to take that rebound energy and refocus it back into the drum in the form of bouncing or recurring strokes. If you notice, my wrist is only moving one time, but in that motion, I'm controlling all those bounces and essentially getting all those strokes for free. Now, a lot of drummers call this the molar method. That's named after Samford Augustus Moeller, who was a prolific teacher back around the mid 20s to the 30s and beyond that. And he taught some amazing drummers like Gene Krupa and most notably Jim Chapin. I feel that Jim Chapin was the one that brought the Moeller method kind of to the forefront. Now what you have to understand is that Samford Moeller didn't invent this. This is something that he just witnessed, noticed, and wrote down. It's something that drummers over time, if you keep playing and you want to get any kind of speed, you kind of have to do. The difference is doing it instinctively versus deliberately practicing it, you could take it a lot further. Now other teachers like George Lawrence Stone, who wrote Stick Control, and his student Joe Morello, who again is one of my favorite teachers of all time, they also use this technique. But that's why I like to generalize it and call it informal versus just molar. <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of videos that are talking about the molar method. And I have to say, looking at videos of molar on the internet, it's a very divisive subject. Some guys are teaching molar, some guys are teaching a weird form of molar. But again, the basic idea is the whip stroke. If you really come back to it, the whole molar method could be summed up by what's called the molar whip. And again, if you're not a student of Stanford molar, you would call that an informal whip stroke. So what is it about the molar method that makes you able to play so fast? Well, it's the idea that from that whip stroke, you create one motion. From that one motion, you get multiple bounces. And usually the first way we teach this is in groups of three. So you do what's called a down stroke, a drop stroke, and then an up stroke. Down, drop it, up it. Down it, drop it, up it. Now yes, I know, if you were studying with Jim Chapin, he would take it into a full position and he'd play down stroke like that, tap stroke like that, up stroke like that, and exaggerate the motions. But in practicality, when I use this and when I teach it for my students, I like to start in the low position. Because as I play this, down, tap, up, down, drop, up, down, drop, up, down, tap, up, you can see that that one flowing motion yields three separate strokes. But really, I'm just moving my hand once. Every time you're doing this, you're really getting this but you're only feeling this. And you could do that with four, five, six, seven, and you know, pretty much as far as you can go before the bounce fades out. Now, if you could get this going with each hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand. Theoretically, what you could do next is interlock them or put them together. So down, down, tap, tap, up, up. Down, down, tap, tap, up, up. So now I'm getting a throw with both hands. And then all the subsequent bounces are interlocking and giving me single strokes. And because you're only feeling the single note with each hand, you could pretty much do this forever without getting tired. The only downside is you need an accent. You have to have the accent. The accent is what creates that kinetic energy and restarts that push every time. Now on the drum set, this is fantastic for moving around the kit because every time you change to a sound source, all you have to do is make it a new accent and you're flying around like crazy. Now this all sounds awesome, right? It sounds like, man, I could just fly around the kit and where's the downside of this? Here's the downside. 
And this is what I learned the hard way. Once you get it going at a certain speed, it's actually harder to control slowly. Like I said, it doesn't really rely as much on muscles. It's more about the motion and relaxation. Now, as tempos get slower, more musculature tends to come in to give the rhythms balance. As tempos get faster, it's less musculature and you're relying more on the energy to move the sticks forward. So when you're a young player and you start getting this really fast, it just feels really good to play it really fast. Doesn't feel so good to do it slowly. So could you imagine what started happening? Because I was so good at just throwing out the molar triplets, I'd be in band situations where I'm playing here. And then if I wanted to do a fast fill, you get situations like that. So I didn't have really great control over slower rhythms or playing inside the transition. The transition is when down tap up, down tap up, stops becoming three separate positions and becomes one position. And that transition happens around 85, 90 beats per minute on the metronome, subjectively. Now on the other side of the coin, once you do develop that foundation and once you have a solid sense of your musculature, how your fingers, your wrists, your hands, your form, and all of that stuff plays into your playing, then the molar method could be an amazing technique to accentuate all this stuff. It's an amazing technique for playing things fast and saving energy as you do it. So kids, the moral of the story is, if you're gonna learn and develop the molar style, do it, but don't make molar your god. Don't do it at the expense of developing your musculature. Make sure that your physicality is happening in addition and in support of learning the whip and the molar stroke. Now, if you're digging these videos and you have some friends that are drummers, feel free to share it, spread the word, let them know. Remember, friends don't let friends play with uncontrolled molar strokes. So do you use the molar method in your playing or do you prefer to keep it physical? Either way, let me know in the comments and let's talk some molar method. And if you haven't yet already, you might wanna consider following the channel. Feel free to subscribe and ring the notification bell. So I'm Jay Fenichel. Thank you so much for checking out the lesson. And until next time, remember, practice with purpose. Oh shit. Totally lost my train of thought now.